For several decades now, neuroscience has been probing deeper and deeper into the human brain to understand its mysteries. Today, researchers are discovering how huge, intricate networks of brain cells, called neurons, are responsible for your ability to see, hear, speak, and remember. Eventually, they will discover exactly how your brain can produce all the functions of your mind. But the fact is, you are more than your brain and its neurons. You're more than the sum of your biological parts, all the cells, tissues, and organs that make up your body. You are a conscious being who is aware of yourself and the world around you. Because of consciousness, you can experience the sweetness of a mango or the fragrance of a rose. Because of consciousness, you have a rich inner life with an amazing range of emotions. Because of consciousness, you can even observe or witness all the activities of your mind, including your emotions. So, in addition to producing mental faculties, how does your brain produce consciousness itself? Well, in recent times, neuroscientists have developed a number of sophisticated theories that attempt to explain this. We'll review some of their theories shortly. So far, none of them have successfully explained how your brain produces consciousness, and such an explanation seems unlikely in the near future. In ancient times, no one considered the brain to be somehow involved in activities like thinking and feeling. The Greek philosopher Aristotle thought that our brains were radiators that cooled the blood circulating through our bodies. In the 17th century, the French philosopher René Descartes thought that the pineal gland which is located deep inside the brain, was the crucial link that connected our machine-like material bodies to our immaterial conscious souls. By the 19th century, doctors who treated patients with brain injuries understood quite well that such injuries could dramatically affect a person's personality, emotions, and other mental faculties. Around the same time, practitioners of phrenology or craniology made wild claims that our mental traits could be identified by the size and location of bumps on our heads. Since those times, neuroscience has made huge strides in understanding the brain and its 100 billion neurons. Particular regions of the brain involved in sight, speech, memory, balance, and so on, are being methodically explored and mapped out in great detail. Brain tissue is microscopically studied to see how neurons are interconnected with each other. The electrical signals that neurons use to communicate are measured either by directly probing the brain or indirectly by using EEG instruments or magnetic stimulation. More recently, functional MRI and PET scans are being used to create highly defined images of neural activity throughout the brain. In the future, new technologies might make it possible to measure the neural activity in your brain so accurately that your innermost thoughts and feelings can be decoded. On the other hand, detecting thoughts and emotions in your brain is not the same as detecting consciousness. Your brain and its neurons generate crucial mental functions like wakefulness, alertness, and attention. But consciousness itself is even more fundamental. 
How is that so? Consider this. Suppose a human-like robot has sophisticated sensors in its nose and tongue that can perform detailed chemical analysis of anything placed in its mouth. The robot could identify each of the specific chemicals responsible for the taste and smell of a ripe mango. But the robot wouldn't experience the sweetness and aroma of a mango like you would. That kind of conscious experience can take place in your brain, but not in the electronic brain of a robot. So, in the next section, we'll explore how conscious experience, like the sweetness of a mango, can arise in your brain. Will scientific research ever locate a particular network of neurons in the brain that are responsible for consciousness itself? Decades ago, some researchers considered this idea, but ongoing studies have completely ruled out the notion that consciousness arises from a single localized source in the brain. All current theories suggest that the source of consciousness is decentralized or distributed. Those theories are highly speculative and extremely difficult to verify. They're also quite complicated, at least for me. Yet, it's really important to understand their basic ideas, so let me give you a quick overview of the main theories. Bernard Bars describes the origin of consciousness in the brain through his global workspace theory. By global workspace, he means a decentralized network of neurons that functions like a screen, a screen onto which various images and ideas are projected. According to Bars, consciousness emerges from the interaction of neurons in that global workspace. Francis Crick received a Nobel Prize for discovering the structure of DNA. Later in his career, he collaborated with a researcher who considers consciousness to be a fundamental property of complex neural networks. Together, they theorized that in a part of the brain known as the clostrum, neurons become synchronized with each other, and their synchronous activity gives rise to consciousness. Giulio Tononi developed a mathematical model of consciousness called integrated information theory. He claims that consciousness is nothing but highly integrated information. According to Tononi, the enormous integration of information in the brain's powerful cerebral cortex gives rise to consciousness. According to the attention schema theory of Michael Gaziano, when the interaction of neurons throughout the brain are filtered by the faculty of attention, a simplified model or representation is created. For Gaziano, that representation or schema is responsible for consciousness. Finally, Robert Penrose is a Nobel laureate in physics who believes that consciousness can never be explained through ordinary physical and mathematical laws. So, he postulates the existence of quantum gravity, and he concludes that consciousness is the result of quantum effects, which are thought to occur in the microtubules found inside cells. Okay, that's enough. As I said, 
All these theories are highly speculative, and none of them are even close to being verified. Yet, they are taken quite seriously by many neuroscientists. Other theories have been proposed by Western philosophers. Some of them suggest that consciousness is an epiphenomenon, a side effect, a side effect of human evolution. When vertebrates evolved into human beings with huge brains, consciousness might have naturally emerged perhaps by one of the neuroscience theories we've just seen. Other philosophers, like Daniel Dennett, try to minimize the significance or role of consciousness. They claim that feeling like a conscious being who enjoys the sweetness of a mango is simply an illusion. What you wrongly consider to be subjective conscious experience is actually produced in your brain like all other mental activities. If you don't completely understand all these theories, that's perfectly okay. I don't either. Among scientists and academics, each of these theories have many supporters and probably just as many critics. But for us, what's important is that all these theories share a crucial feature. They all attribute the origin of consciousness to the brain and its neurons. Such theories are called materialist or physicalist. They're physicalist because they accept the existence of matter and energy alone but they reject the existence of any kind of non-material, non-physical reality. In Advaita Vedanta, consciousness is a non-material, non-physical, fundamental reality. Fortunately, you don't have to be a neuroscientist or a philosopher to understand it properly, as we'll see in the next section. The rishis of ancient India and the great Vedantic scholars who followed never even imagined that consciousness could be produced by the human brain. So it's no surprise that their teachings never directly addressed any physicalist theories, like those of modern neuroscientists and philosophers. But in today's world, scientific advances have given those physicalist theories a lot of traction, a lot of credibility. As a result, those theories can threaten the very foundation of spiritual teachings that say your true self, Atma, is pure consciousness the light of awareness that reveals or illumines all the activities of your mind. Since this teaching is directly contradicted by current physicalist theories, they should not be ignored or taken lightly. Long ago, teachers of Advaita Vedanta directly addressed the opposing views of other schools of thought like the dualism accepted by the Sankhyas and the nihilism accepted by Buddhists. But today, the biggest challenge to Vedanta comes not from these ancient schools of thought, but from modern physicalist theories for the origin of consciousness. Fortunately, Vedanta's teachings are so complete and thorough that they can effectively respond to these new challenges. From the perspective of Advaita Vedanta, the basic shortcoming of neuroscience is that it's limited to describing how billions of neurons in your brain interact with each other 
to produce your thoughts, emotions, and other mental activities. Vedanta, on the other hand, goes a step further, a huge step further, by showing how your thoughts and emotions are known to you, how they're observed by you, how they're witnessed by you. That means, in addition to the mental activities produced by neurons in your brain, there is another factor involved. And that factor is you, the conscious being, the awareful subject who observes every mental object produced by your brain. So, we can say that neuroscience describes the brain, its neurons, and the mental objects they produce, whereas Vedanta describes the very consciousness by which those mental objects are known. And that consciousness is your essential nature, because basically you are a conscious being. In Advaita Vedanta, consciousness is a fundamental reality. Whereas science considers matter and energy alone to be fundamental, the rishis of ancient India considered matter and energy to merely be forms or manifestations of an underlying reality that's even more fundamental. They called that underlying reality Brahman. And they described it as Satyam Jnanam Anantam. Satya means the underlying reality because of which everything exists, the so-called fabric of existence. But Brahman is much more than that. It's also jnanam, intelligence, knowledge, consciousness. Brahman is responsible for the intelligent natural order that governs the cosmos a universal order that includes all the laws of nature, like gravity, momentum, and so on. Brahman is also responsible for the presence of consciousness throughout the world, including its presence in your own brain, as we'll discuss shortly. Finally, Brahman is anantam, limitless, boundaryless. Since the universe is vast, its source must be more than vast. Its source must be infinite. So, in simple English, Brahman can be called the infinite intelligent fabric of existence. Brahman gives existence not only to the physical universe, but to you and me as well, to our bodies and minds. Brahman is also the source for our consciousness and the consciousness of all sentient beings. Brahman's presence within us as consciousness is called Atma, the true self. And in highly intelligent beings, like you and me, that consciousness becomes manifest as the observer or awareful witness of the thoughts and emotions produced by our brains. That consciousness is present in your experience right now as you watch this video, which is, after all, a conscious experience. But even though you already know that you're a conscious being, you might not know that your consciousness is actually the presence of Brahman the fundamental reality, the fabric of existence. Fortunately, you can discover your true nature through the powerful method of self-inquiry that's taught by Advaita Vedanta. That method has been discussed in many of my other videos, so we won't dwell on it here. Even though Vedantic self-inquiry can lead to the discovery of the true nature of consciousness, it turns out that conventional scientific methods can never lead to that same discovery. 
Why not? Well, science is based on observation. The observation of worldly objects and phenomena, like looking at the stars with a telescope. But consciousness can never be found by looking through the lens of a telescope or with any other kind of scientific instrument. It can only be found by reversing the direction of your inquiry. Rather than looking for consciousness in the world, you have to look within yourself. You have to use introspection, not scientific instruments, because consciousness belongs to the observer, not to objects being observed. Let me explain. When thoughts and emotions are produced by your brain, your experience of them is said to be private. That means those experiences are only accessible or available to you, to you alone. No one else can feel what you're feeling right now. Neuroscientists can study your brain and one day they might be able to accurately detect your thoughts and emotions, but they will never be able to observe your personal, private experience. They will never know how it feels to be you. Even if they explain how your brain produces feelings of sadness and perceptions of color, they can never know what sadness feels like to you, or what a particular shade of green looks like to you. Neuroscience can't observe your private conscious experience, nor can it detect or measure consciousness itself. For this reason, neuroscience on its own can't discover or explain the origin of consciousness. Of course, most neuroscientists are really smart, so it's not surprising that at least some of them acknowledge this problem. They admit that they can't directly observe or study consciousness itself. They accept the fact that their research is limited to the brain's intricate neural networks and the mental activities produced by those networks. Neuroscientists call those mental activities the neural correlates of consciousness. It is those neural correlates of consciousness that they actually study, not consciousness itself. Some researchers who understand the limitations of neuroscience try to escape those limitations to better understand the nature of consciousness. We'll discuss their ideas in the final part of this presentation. The hard problem of consciousness is an expression coined by a philosopher named David Chalmers. He uses the expression to describe the apparently insurmountable obstacles that prevent neuroscientists from directly observing or studying consciousness. Much like in Advaita Vedanta, Chalmers differentiates the objective existence of thoughts and emotions from your subjective conscious experience of them. He says, why should physical processing in your brain give rise to a rich inner life at all? It seems unreasonable that it should, and yet it does. If any problem qualifies as the problem of consciousness, it is this one. Having recognized this problem, Chalmers himself proposes an alternative 
to the physicalist worldview, the view that accepts only matter and energy as being fundamental. Chalmers says that consciousness is another fundamental reality that exists in addition to matter and energy. According to this theory, consciousness is a natural feature or property of the universe along with matter and energy. This theory is called panpsychism, and it's been around for a long time. Yet Chalmers uses it very skillfully to explain how consciousness might simply be a natural property of brain matter that enables it to produce subjective conscious experience. But many knowledgeable critics argue that panpsychism is merely a philosophical concept and not a legitimate scientific theory. They reject it because it can't be experimentally tested by scientific methods. As we discussed before, consciousness itself can't be scientifically detected or measured. Panpsychism resembles Advaita Vedanta in some ways, but in fact, the two are quite different. How? Panpsychism is a kind of dualism. It accepts two fundamental realities, the physical reality of matter and energy and the non-physical reality of consciousness. Advaita Vedanta, on the other hand, is a non-dualistic teaching. It accepts only one fundamental reality, Brahman. In Advaita Vedanta, matter and energy are considered to be simply forms or manifestations of Brahman and not independent realities. In addition to David Chalmers, other modern philosophers have used a variety of strategies trying to address the hard problem of consciousness. Some of them have resorted to idealism, an ancient philosophy that's still studied today. Idealism accepts only consciousness as a fundamental reality, and it rejects the reality of matter and energy. Other philosophers theorize a single fundamental reality that's responsible both for the physical world of matter and energy as well as the non-physical reality of consciousness. This theory is known as neutral monism. Like panpsychism, Idealism and neutral monism have some similarities with Advaita Vedanta, but they also have many glaring differences. Further, they're not widely accepted, and they have no completely satisfactory solution to the hard problem of consciousness. Okay, this has been a very intense and challenging discussion. If you're still watching this video, you should be congratulated for your patience and dedication. I actually avoided making this video for several years because I was intimidated by the complexity of the theories we've discussed here. But after a lot of study, it became clear to me that none of the theories can really threaten the validity of Advaita Vedanta. Why? Because the scientific and philosophical methods they use all suffer from their own limitations. On the other hand, Advaita Vedanta is free from those limitations because it's neither a science nor a philosophy. Vedanta is a powerful method of self-inquiry that can lead you to discover your true nature. And that inquiry is not based on scientific observation 
or on philosophical speculation. It's based on your own conscious experience. Mm -hmm.